Okay, welcome, welcome, for real. Um, welcome everyone, thank you for coming to our first MFA program on Zoom, or program event on Zoom, or it might not be the first, I wasn't here last spring when all of this fell upon us very suddenly. Um, we are here again, um, apart but together. Um, it's great to see all your faces. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your last night of your summer break um, to launch the fall semester with our annual fall faculty reading. It's very odd to have a fall event on uh, during a heat wave, but then again, that's falls are just odd in general in the Bay Area, as you know, or if you've just moved here, as you'll soon find out. Um, it's not quite a hayride and a harvest pumpkin picking season. Okay, we've got one more. What can I say about our last reader, Lala Khadivi? I found myself at a loss for words. One option was to retell a joke she once told me at my expense when I hit 40 and started worrying about entering a midlife crisis. She said, what would you even do, buy platter shirts? And it was, it was a very sick burn. Um, and I thought of that again when I chose this shirt from the closet today. And I hope that joke gives you something of Lale's sense of humor, but also the shrewdness of her eye and her intellect. Lale's been teaching fiction in the MFA program since 2015, making this her five-year anniversary reading. She is the author of the Kurdish trilogy of novels, uh, which includes The Age of Orphans, The Walking, and A Good Country. Her fiction and nonfiction have appeared in the LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, VQR, and The Sun. And Lale has won the Whiting Award, an NEA grant, and the Barnes & Noble Discovery, uh, Discover New Writers Award. She holds an MFA from Mills College here in the Bay Area, and she lives in Oakland with her dog and the rest of her family. They're, they're fine people, but that dog is spectacular. Um, this fall, she's teaching a long fiction workshop and the seminar Intention and Design in Prose. So let's not hear it, but see it for tonight's last reader, Lale Kadir. Hi, um, it is so nice to see so many of you, even if you're just names and some of your faces. And oh my gosh, Alan, Lauren, Lewis, thank you so much. This is, um, I kind of just want to go home now, but I am home. So <laughs> I don't know where to go from this point out. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I have a really short piece. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I feel like this last six months has either opened the floodgates or shut off the tap. It's definitely shut off the tap for me. Um, but I did promise myself when I found out about these readings when I first started working um, at USF that I would show up with something that was really new because our students show up with really new stuff and that's so scary. And um, after a while, you don't have to show up with new stuff anymore, you can kind of hide. And I was just gonna like get scared with all of you right now. I wrote this like six days ago. <laughs> Um, so here we go. It's called, What Else Do You Like? Each day, the woman commutes home just before rush hour. Her work at the clinic ends at 3, and by 3.30, she moves smoothly through the countryside in a state of easy detachment. The labor of the day done, the fluorescent lights, cold air, and antiseptic floors recede, and her bones relax into the seat, and she thinks towards evening and its little pleasures, dinner with its salt and oils, the glass of wine, the conversation and cigarettes with neighbors on the veranda at dusk. Later in life, she remembers these rides as strange luxuries, the airy train compartment, the bright yellow hillsides flashing out the window, the company of the strangers around her, a momentary gathering of intimates. Today, like most days, there are mothers with their young children back from the city center, old men and women alone and in pairs, their hats and newspapers and canes a few official looking middle-aged men in suits and a handful of day workers in sweated through shirts. At the far end of the car, a dozen high schoolers share headphones, bags of chips, screens of their cell phones. A few of the boys and girls are intertwined, hand to hand, hand to hip, hand in the back pocket of the other jean, jeans. But mostly the boys sit together and the girls do the same. The woman stares at them, not because they're interesting in their style or posture, all of which are predictable, the typical click of teenagers anxious to fit in, nothing daring, nothing to shatter the mold of what their parents expect. She stares because she is tired and these young bodies and faces flinch in a constant impatience that soothes her. 
After a time, the woman looks away, out the window, to the hills speckled with their square bales of hay. At the stop after the tunnel, a young woman gets on. She enters alone and is followed by a warm rush of wind. All eyes look up to behold the tight white bike shorts, the white sports bra, the dirty white shoes. Her body is round and full and short, her skin supple with no more than 15 or 20 or maybe 25 years. Like the woman herself, it is clear the new passenger is not born of the country they move through and that on a good day, they're both considered long-term guests. At the far end of the train car, the high school boys elbow each other and mutter, look, look. She spots them and a smile stretches across her face as she walks toward them evocatively, something of a catwalk prowl paired with a flirtatious chin tilt. A friend, an acquaintance, someone from their neighborhood or school, the woman finds she is relieved at the possibility they might know each other. But as the new passenger approaches, she sees there are no kisses, no embraces, no recognitions of familiarity. And the woman sees that they are not friends and that the young woman is a stranger to them, an eager stranger, but unknown nonetheless. Some of the girls roll their eyes while the other girls giggle and say things behind cupped hands. The girls glance at the smile, the clothes, the full form and open stare, attitudes they've been warned against by their nervy mothers, and they take a step away. The boys, warned of nothing, take a step forward, assessing, and the train car is now warmer than the woman would like. The young woman stops in front of the half circle of boys with a hip cock to the side and her thumbs hooked to the shoulder straps of her backpack. Do you like music? Music, they respond, sure, sure, we like music. And then she is singing, a pop song with a catchy rhythm that pulses through chest and lips. Her voice, more ache than joy, has a charm she herself cannot seem to control. Everyone looks, the mother and the children, the old people and the workmen all listen to the young woman as if she calls to them personally. A few of the high school students begin to sing the words they know, and the boys grin and shift their weight from side to side. A tall boy takes a step closer. Where do you go to school? Her song stops, and the young woman hums for a second before answering, I am done with school. She walks to the nearest pole, a vertical metal handrail covered in prints, clasps it, and begins to twirl in slow circles. What else do you like? She asks and waits for no answer. I like music and sports. She climbs deftly up the pole and wraps her legs tightly around it at the top and lets loose her hands until she is upside down and spinning. The boys clap and whistle and the girls either turn away to laugh or laugh straight out, their faces flush red. The woman and the other passengers look at the spectacle and then one another. A child shouts mama and is quickly shushed. The young woman pulls herself up and holds the pole as she begins to sing another song, a slower song. She caresses her own shoulders, thighs and face and slides down the pole and the boys step closer to her, making a circle in which they stand, arms crossed, faces alight. The young woman's smile is broader than ever and she turns in the circle. Who wants a kiss? A few boys laugh, a few others groan quietly. One of the boys gets claps on the shoulders and steps forward. Close your eyes, the girl instructs him. He backs up and with the defiance of a five-year-old demands, no, no, you close your eyes. The young woman, who is either 15 or 20 or 25, smiles and closes her eyes and tilts her head to the side. No one moves, no one says anything, and the boys continue to joke between themselves, and the girl stands in the middle, soft face, as one pretends to go forward and then another, and then the tallest steps to her, bends his head down and pushes his lips onto hers. The girls gasp and boys cheer, and the businessmen and mothers and workmen look at each other as if to ask, can you believe it? For shame. It becomes clear their lips have opened and their mouths are locked together. So when the train lurches, the couple loses their balance, but not their lock, and he grabs onto her in something like an embrace. For a moment, the tall boy is gone, gone to his friends, to the train, to the golden countryside outside, taken away by the stranger, while around them, everyone else sits in a new shared nakedness. Finally, the shouts of his friends are too much and the shrieks of the girls are too much and the tall boy pulls away everything to leave her face as smiling as he found it. The train makes its scheduled stop and the teen boys crackle with questions. Where do you live? Can we visit? Where are you from? The young woman laughs and proudly shouts her place of birth as she adjusts her small bits of clothing. 
The tall one grabs her arm and she shakes it off. Bye. And walks out the door of the train to the voice of the conductor announcing the station name. The boys hit one another on the back with the backs of their hands and say things to tease the tall one who shakes his rueful head and mutters, immigrant slut. The girls are laughing again, their faces taut and tidy in prim judgment. They put their headphones back on, go back to their shared screens, shared chips, and seek out whatever hand they were holding before. The woman looks around, searches every face, but no one will meet her eye. Four stops from home, she gathers her things quickly and steps out onto the hot platform, neither here nor there. She seeks out the hair and body and white shorts of the stranger. She spots her boarding the train on the opposite track, the one heading back to the city center. The woman, her body jolted into motion far ahead of her mind, rushes across the platform and steps onto the train just in time. Thank you.